Well, my channel's back from the dead, and well, episode two of the Halo TV show has gone live, so I wanted to give you my thoughts and opinions and some of the questionable choices they made with episode two and how different this one is compared to episode one. I'll be upfront saying that there will be spoilers kind of scattered throughout the entirety of this video, but if any kind of review video, guys, you should watch the actual show before watching their review. But let's not waste any more time and jump right into this review so we can understand all the details. <laughs> He said it! He said it! So this episode is very dialogue focused. There was no action happening with this episode. Uh, so overall, like not as like, exciting visually as the first episode where it kind of came out swinging. This episode kind of comes in chilling into the next episode where it kind of really just focuses on a lot of the subplots that were kind of set up throughout the first episode. Following up things with Cortana, following things up with Master Chief and his personality, things are going on with him. We learn more about the artifact. We learn more about the blessed ones. It's not just Maki, but it seems to be Master Chief as well, along with some interesting takes on Halo lore as a whole. So let's just jump right into what actually happens. So like we see Soren in the beginning of the episode that happens about 22 years before the events that are happening within the show right there. And it kind of just goes into establishing who Soren is as a character. It was just kind of interesting seeing Chief seem to have like second thoughts when leaving. Now I did not read all the Halo books, but apparently he had a little bit of that feeling uh, later on with some of the books. So that's kind of interesting that I always kind of viewed Master Chief as like, no, this is the way, the only way to do things. And Soren's like, nah, dog, there's another way to do things. Now in traditional Halo lore, Soren was actually way more deformed than what we see in the TV show. In the TV show, he just like from his left arm to his elbow to his rest of his arm, it's just kind of like all messed up from the augmentations. So that's, you know, would make sense, but like also like his legs and his, there's no Spartan armor that can actually fit Soren according to the lore. And so with this one, like they kind of fall along with it, but definitely changed it a little bit. I think just being like a Spartan, you probably just need to wear that armor as like that visual similarity between Chief and Soren, just so they kind of have like that established kind of mindset of these characters. So I guess it kind of makes sense because with the books, what actually happens is that Soren uh, gets regulated to a desk job since his, since his deformities were so great, he couldn't be a Spartan at all. And so then you got put to a desk job and then Soren kind of it came and runs with a character who was inciting with the insurrectionist who kind of convinced Soren to run away with him. They go flying off of the planet of Reach. You and see shoot them down. He lands in the woods and, you know, basically has to like, yeah, get away from there. Which actually does happen basically within the Halo TV show, right? Soren goes off, flies off with a long sword kind of at the middle of the night, escaping from the UNSC facilities, then gets shot down kind of through the left in the woods and stuff like that. So it's kind of the same thing, but different. I think that's one of those examples of why they're not really following the lore exactly but just because like you're great basically getting to the same point but you're just kind of cutting out a lot of the little details that like led soren to do the things that he did except that this time we just kind of established that he's just kind of like more of a rebel kind of guy the next we see chief taking kwan to the rebel which is the last known place of soren according to master chief and so then that this place actually right here the rebel is actually a place in the halo lore from the book the cole protocol which interesting thing that the insurrectionists that live there having like an uneasy peace with the jackals now i do wish we saw this in action but to have it so early on in the tv show without having any context of previous halo lore and how the different species kind of work together then yeah i can kind of see like why kind of excluding the jackals away from like the people just kind of walking around the rubble so that does kind of make sense also fun thing i want to point out when they first walked in to the rubble you see like the door right it has like a vault it's totally like a fallout well there's no way you make that design of the vault and not make a reference to fallout i would say that the rubble definitely does look like you're on a set in a way just because of how close quarters everything is it doesn't really feel very natural but again it just kind of comes to those situations where you bring something into real life you have a limited budget that yeah yeah you can't go super expansive when it comes to these environments of course it would be kind of compact living on an asteroid there's not a lot of space there i will also say that the rubble as a whole for all the cgi work was actually very well done and then we had some questions about the cgi in episode one i think that was more just kind of like last minute retakes and stuff like that which happens all the time with tv shows that sometimes you just need to kind of get something done real quick and that's why sometimes like that assault rifle didn't really look that great but this the rubble as a whole looked fantastic it looked very well detailed looked very much like a place that lived within the halo universe next soren takes chief to his home which is one of the attached asteroids and I just kind of loved how this kind of like 
made Master Chief kind of look like he was kind of like second guessing himself in a way, uh, when, especially in that question when he said, do you, you have family in a way? And had like a bit of a puzzled like reaction, like this is possible kind of thing. Now I can't remember of like Spartans after being augmented or sterile or anything like that. It just feels like they're kind of planting these little seeds on Master Chief's character saying like, hey, there is a life outside of the UNSC. Maybe there might be another point where he actually might want to escape just like Soren did. Now the whole scene when they cut back to High Charity with the Prophets, Maki, and that elite that saw what Chief did, a lot of people said that that elite right there is going to be the Arbiter. I don't think so, because one, the Arbiter is not mentioned at all within the IMDB credits. Obviously, it's kind of fan generated, so they can be completely, you know, sure about that. But I don't really expect there to really be an Arbiter. I have a feeling, because like, because the whole idea of the Arbiter's character is to be kind of like that bridge between the Covenant and the humans. And I feel like that's kind of what Maquis is kind of doing right here in this show. I mean, I have all the characters within the Halo show so far on the Covenant side of things. Maki is actually getting the most screen time, meaning to most likely be that type of character. Though I still hope that the Covenant have like direct in interactions with like, you know, the high command of UNSC. Uh, just because I don't want to have like Mickey be like the only way for like the UNSC to talk with is like another human but on the Covenant side of things. It's just, I, I don't like that. I'd rather have, see like direct conversations from the Covenant to humans. Now to me, the shining gem of this entire episode was actually the discussion with the UNSC High Command about what's going on with Master Chief and the, you know, the UNSC progress right now. I love the dialogue that Halsey has throughout this entire episode and especially in this scene, how she essentially corners Parangoski in a corner saying that like, hey, I've been doing this the whole time when it comes to the human flash cloning and things like that. And she's known about it, but hasn't shut me down. So basically if Parangoski wasn't all for it, but basically would say that like Halsey's been going off the rails under her command, jeopardizing her Parangoski's position. So Parangoski kind of gets caught up in having to end up just like going along with the whole Cortana project as well, which I feel is just like so typical Halsey to just like find ways to kind of catch people in very awkward situations, corner them and then get them what she wants ultimately. It's just a, such a Halsey move. I love the dialogue that she has entire, like I said, throughout this entirety episode, but definitely through that sit down discussion. Coming back to Soren and the Master Chief and Quan, that whole story arc that's going on right there. Soren ends up touching the artifact and well, nothing happens, which is a slight retcon when it comes to the traditional lore of Halo where humans own the mantle of responsibility, therefore can interface with Forerunner tech. But it seems like now you have to be a blessed one to be able to do that, which would be either currently, as we know right now, Master Chief or Maki, which would be kind of weird in a way, but I guess maybe just to make them seem a little bit more like special within the show. I'll keep an eye and see how this whole like plot point plays out because it definitely is different. It just could be maybe the same thing, but just kind of different. I don't know. It's just like, it's just one of those things I was like, when I saw it happen, I'm like, oh, well, that's a big change. I mean, ultimately, humans are the only ones so far that can interact with Forerunner tech, which still lines up with the Halo lore. It's just different. Then Soren brings up that they should go see Reth, who might have some more information about the Forerunner tech, which apparently Reth, for the traditional Halo lore, is actually a jackal that was on the Rebel. And so then when you saw that within the show, obviously he was just a human. This could be one of those things where it's just like one of those difficulties of bringing something to real live action that like, if you're gonna have a conversation one-to-one -one with like a jackal, the CGI needs to be very, very well done. And sometimes with a TV show, you just might not have the time or budget to put something together like that. So I can understand why going with like a human in the situation where it just might be overall just a little bit easier. And it's a side character, not super important to the story. Though ultimately it would be way more cool if it was like a jackal caught up that like the humans captured and then like maybe the for the jackal to gain his freedom needs to like gain the trust of the humans by giving them information you know that whole dialogue kind of thing would be kind of cool but there's a just a human but the whole thing i have about this is that like this is a really big exposition dump that happens right here and basically you learn about like blessed ones you learn about like the covenant and like the halo ring and stuff like that and basically like it just kind of plays off like the whole like traditional like American like media thing or like where people would get abducted by aliens and come back and they're just freaking crazy people, which I guess I can kind of see why, but like how did Reth like get away from the Covenant and how did he end up learning so much about the Covenant while being like a prisoner when they're speaking a completely different language? Unless this is like revealed later on that maybe like Maki tried to like help out Reth and then like that's how she Maki got those markings on her back or something like that. There might be more 
story being told right here about like why Reth is the way he is. Uh, but I just felt like it was just kind of like really like off-putting how like crazy he was supposed to be. But and, and then also on top of that, like Master Chief just kind of goes along with this. So like, okay, this is all like actual facts apparently. Learn this from like a guy who's like literally insane. Like imagine if Master Chief brought Wrath with him to the UNSC and he's like, no, this is what he told me. And he's just like insane. They're gonna be like, you believe this crazy dude? Like this guy hasn't brushed his teeth in like three years and you're expecting him to know inf information about the foreigners that which are, we don't even know about in the story yet. I just feel like there was like a better way to go about like learning that information. Uh, I understand like maybe like that at some point you just need to kind of like hurry up like the plot exposition stuff to kind of get the story moving, you know? I mean, it's quite often within storytelling within media as a whole that you come across a character who is like, I have all the answers kind of thing. And then they move forward and like your main character can go forward and like progress the story and plot forward. Then learning once there's something bigger than what Chief can handle by himself, he goes, okay, I just need to turn myself in, go back to the UNSC and tell him what I learned kind of thing, which then goes back to him being in prison, sitting next to Halsey. And like Halsey felt like a bit of a motherly figure within the situation, which would make sense with the traditional Halo lore. But I feel like he's also not only like getting the information that she needs, but also kind of manipulating Chief, but also caring for him at the same time. Where like, I feel like she's kind of mentally setting up Master Chief to be like, you're kind of off the rails, you're kind of reckless. We need to implement Cortana into you to kind of keep you in check kind of thing, which I feel like she's totally setting him up in this process. And also trying to suppress those memories, which is like, I we don't need to talk about that right now kind of thing. Where Chief, as his whole life, he's known the UNSC as like, a you know parenting figure a place to go back for truth and comfort and then to you know have like these questions within himself starts making him question like how loyal does he need to be to unsc again like i said like the dialogue that halsey has within this episode is just absolutely fantastic it was very well written very well thought out very well set up as well when it comes to the show and then we finish off the episode watching halsey activate the flash clone that will eventually be used to create cortana now how are they going to take out those brains of that clone, you know, without being like, oh my God, we're killing people within the show. But you never know. Hey, we straight up slaughtered like innocent children and old people in the first episode. Why not kill like a Flash clone? But it just like, it just, it just feels super weird. But we'll see how that plays out within the third episode. And for what I've seen on Twitter, there was a Bungie employee who knows Frankie, who obviously has seen the series already, he said that episode three will be a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more familiar to Halo fans. So I'm expecting to see a good amount of action, some crazy stuff going down right there, which I'm very excited about. And I cannot wait to the third episode of this. So overall, my thoughts on the Halo show episode two, very dialogue focused, but I felt very drawn to like almost every scene that happened. That was very important to help kind of fulfill these subplots that were set up in episode one. I would say I still enjoyed episode one more, mainly because like the action scenes were pretty freaking cool. Um, but I think this episode still, while some people are saying it's a filler, I felt like way more than a filler because it helped establish a lot more of the subplots, helped kind of provide more information of like Master Chief, maybe the questions that they're going to propose to him later on in the series as well. It just felt like it was setting up a lot more things, which was much more than just like a typical filler episode like we have with like the Mandalorian with like the Snow Spiders episode. Like, yeah, that was definitely, that's definitely filler. This episode is definitely not filler, but certainly less action packed, but also equally as important. Let me know what your thoughts are on episode two of the Halo TV show, guys. If you like these kind of videos, make sure to tap that like button. Let me know you want to see some more reviews like this. I might have some more information coming out to you guys as well about the Halo TV show. Maybe some lore about the Rebel. Maybe some more detailed lore on Soren and things like that and the differences between the lore and the show. But if you guys want to see that, let me know in the comment section down below. If you're new to the channel, miss any content from me recently, check out this playlist right here. I can link to all my Halo news and informational videos right there. Thanks so much for watching. Greatly appreciate it. Catch you on the next one. Peace out.